Biblical creation is the view of origins that is based on the Bible. The major portion of the Bible dealing with origins is Genesis 1-11. through Biblical creation assumes the Bible is the inspired word of God and takes the Genesis account as literal history. Biblical creation does not agree with the atheistic myth of Big Bang to man evolution. However, despite the claims of evolution that this atheistic mythology is science, there are good scientific reasons why Big Bang to man evolution is impossible. The key to understanding this issue is to understand that when evolutionists claim evidence for evolution, this so-called evidence is actually interpretations of evidence that assume evolution as a starting assumption. What follows is an in-depth study of what the Bible says about the origin of the universe, the earth, and mankind. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, in the tree yielding fruit, whose seed is in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and evening in the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and in evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great wheels and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas. And let fowl multiply in the earth, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth, after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and every thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man after our image, and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which there is fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, whereupon there is life. I have given even the green herb for meat, and it was so. 
And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. In the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis 1 clearly shows that God created the earth, the universe, and all living things in six earth days. The fact that Genesis 1 refers to six literal earth days is indicated by both the use of a number in reference to evening and morning. It is further supported by Exodus 20.11. Exodus 20.11 For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. On day one, God created the heaven, the earth, as well as light in the day-night cycle. The light he created here can still be seen today, redshifted into microwaves called the cosmic background radiation. Day two, God created a space between the waters below and waters above. This water is still out there beyond the farthest galaxy. Psalms 148.4 Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. On day three, God created dry land, calling it earth, and the water he called seas. He also created plant life to reproduce after its kind. On day four, God created the sun, moon, and stars. On day five, God created sea life and birds. On day six, God created land animals and mankind. Man and woman were created in the image of God. God gave plants to be food for animals and man. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth, when God made them in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. And God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God grow every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. And the name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havana, where is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and the brilliant in Ornax stone. And the name of the second river was Gohan. It is the same that encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river was is Hideko. It is it which goeth towards the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eateth thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be 
one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The first part of Genesis chapter 2 is God resting on the seventh day. This was not because God was tired, but an example for us, as well as showing an end to God's creative work. This is followed by a summary of creation, and then the creation of man. Note that in verse 7 it says, God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and not that he evolved man from apes. Next it shows God making the Garden of Eden, and Adam naming the animals. We then see Eve be made from Adam's rib. Once again, we have a special act of creation with no hint of evolution. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they showed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and as eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field, and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. And, and the Lord God said, Behold, man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out man and placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Here we have the fall of man. There are six basic elements to this account that need to be addressed. The tree, the serpent, the temptation, the curse, the promise, and the expulsion. 
The tree was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and not the tree of knowledge, as is sometimes falsely claimed. There may have been nothing special about the tree other than the fact that God said not to eat of it. In other words, all of the effects of eating the fruit were probably a result of disobeying God rather than some property of the fruit itself. While the talking snake sounds strange at first glance, it is clear from elsewhere in the Bible that the serpent was Satan. The serpent's punishment seems to have resulted in snakes losing their legs. It is also clear that the serpent was a real snake as well. The best explanation is that the serpent was a snake that Satan had used and spoke through to fool Eve. The temptation was to gain knowledge in a manner contrary to the will of God. Also, up until then, Adam and Eve knew only good, and so they were tempted into seeking to know evil. Satan took advantage of Eve's misquote of God's command to trick her into eating the fruit. The curse was the entrance of death and suffering into the world. It also meant that Adam and Eve would pass a sin nature down to their descendants. The promise that followed the curse was the first promise of the coming Redeemer, Jesus Christ. On the cross, Satan bruised Jesus' heel. In the process, Jesus crushed Satan's head by providing redemption. As a result, it is by believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and trusting Jesus to save us, repenting of our sin, that we are saved from that sin and able to go to heaven. The expulsion was mainly to keep Adam and Eve from the tree of life. To keep them from going back, God placed an angel there to guard the way. Today, the garden no longer exists, being destroyed in the flood. And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. In the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side of thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. For with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female, a fowl after their kind, and cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, 
and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so did he. There are two main interpretations of the sons of God in this chapter. One is that they are fallen angels that married and had children with human women. The other is that they are a reference to the line of Seth marrying women from the line of Cain. The line of Seth view suffers from a lack of scriptural basis for calling sons of Seth sons of God. Also, if this is a case of sons of Seth marrying daughters of Cain, why not just say so? Also, godly men marrying ungodly women will not produce unusual children. The only support for this view comes from Matthew 22.30, which says that the angels of God in heaven do not marry. It's assumed this somehow eliminates fallen angels from marrying. The fallen angel view is based on Job 1.6, Job 2.1, and Job 38.7, which clearly refers to angels and are the only other Old Testament usage of the term sons of God. Such a union would also explain the unusual offspring such as giants. It also shows why the flood was so important, since Adam's line could have been in danger of being wiped out. Further support is found in Genesis 6-9, which says that Noah was perfect in his generations, which fits if fallen angels had contaminated Adam's line. In an event, God tells Noah to build an ark that is to save himself, his family, and all kinds of land animals from a flood he is sending on the earth to destroy mankind. According to the Bible, the ark is 300 cubits long, or 450 feet, 30 cubits high, or 45 feet, 50 cubits wide, or 75 feet. This is 1.52 million cubic feet, and the equivalent of 522 railroad stock cars. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou in all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. In every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, male and his female, and the beasts that are not clean by twos, male and his female. A fowl also of the air by sevens, male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the faces of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And a clean beast and a beast that are not clean, and a fowl, and every thing that creepeth upon the earth. And they went in two and two, unto Noah, into the ark, male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass, after seven days, that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. The selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Jacob and the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl of the air after his kind every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two by two, of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went into the ark, went in, male and female, of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills which were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. 
And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. And all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping thing, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. Noah was told to go into the ark with his family seven of every kind of clean animal, two of every kind of unclean animal, and seven of every kind of bird. No, they do not have to gather the animals. God sent them. Rain lasting 40 days and 40 nights. The fountains of the great deep breaking up. The flood was global. All the mountains of the time, high hills, were covered. The highest mountain was covered to a depth of 15 cubits, 22 and a half feet, which gave the ark clearance. All land animals and humans outside the ark were killed. It would be 150 days, five months, before the land would exist again. God remembered Noah and every living thing, and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the great deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. After the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass, at the end of forty days, that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her feet, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into him, into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days, and again sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in evening, and lo, her mouth was inaudibly blocked off. So no one knew the water were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up off the earth, and Noah removed the cover of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou, thy wife, thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. And every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kind went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelt a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, 
shall not cease. The water dries up. Noah, his family, and all the animals leave the ark. Noah sacrifices one of every clean fowl and land animal, which is why he took seven of each of these kinds. God promises not to send another global flood. Making a rainbow has a sign of this promise. And the whole earth was one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confuse the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. The Tower of Babel. They were not literally trying to build a tower up to heaven where God is, but it was a high tower built for the purpose of worship. To start the project, God confused the languages so they could not talk to each other. This forced them to scatter over the earth. It is during the scattering that the different races diversified. This would have included such groups as Homo erectus and Neanderthals, though Neanderthals may have been men that were hundreds of years old. The post-flood ice age would have aided scattering by forming land bridges across bodies of water such as the Bering Strait. The end result was that mankind and animals spread all over the world. Now, the Bible does not set exact dates for creation in the flood, but it does provide information that allows these dates to be estimated. The time from creation to the flood is found in the genealogy in Genesis 5 and Noah's age at the time of the flood in Genesis 7. They yield a figure of 1,660 plus or minus four years. The margin of error results from the Bible only using whole years. Each son could have been born any time in that year. The post-flood genealogy goes from Shem to Abraham 355 plus or minus five years later, Genesis 11, 10 through 31. Now there is a gap in this genealogy shown by the genealogy of Jesus through Mary in Luke 3. Luke 3 includes a man named Canaan between Selah and Arphaphat that is missing in Genesis 11. The likely reason for Canaan's omission in Genesis 11 is that he died before his son Selah was born, with Selah being raised by his grandfather. The average age at the birth of the son in Genesis 11 for Atrax, Selah, Ember, Peleg, Reu, Sarah, and Nahor was 31 plus or minus 4 years thus extending the amount of time between the flood and Abraham to 386 plus or minus 9 years. Now Abraham was 75 years old when he got the promise from God to give the land to his descendants, Genesis 12, 1-4. And the exodus occurred 130 years later, Galatians 3:17. Now the laying of the foundation of the temple by Solomon can be dated with high accuracy to 967 B.C., from here, we just need to do some math. We get a date for the Exodus of 987 plus 480 for 1467 B.C. That places Abraham's promise being given in 1467 plus 430 for 1897 B.C. This produces a date for the flood of 1897 plus 75 plus or minus one year plus 386 plus or minus 9 equals 2358 plus or minus 10. That is 2358 BC with a range of 2348 to 2368. The resulting date for creation is 
2358 plus or minus 10 plus 1660 plus or minus 4 equals 4018 plus or minus 14. That is 4018 BC with a range of 4062 to 404 BC. So the creation occurred 6033 years ago with a range of 6019 to 6047. Contrary to the claims of evolutionists, biblical creation is not anti-science nor unscientific. Now, selection is not a problem for biblical creation, but it is limited to being capable of producing varieties within kinds of organisms. Yes, biblical creation contradicts common descent of all life on Earth in the Big Bang. However, Big Bang to man evolution is not real science, but atheistic mythology being pushed as science. There is actually a considerable amount of scientific support for biblical creation, including the simultaneous sedimentation of many layers in moving water, whom diffusion rates in zircons consistent with 6,000 years and not billions of years. This is evidence for accelerated nuclear decay. Special and general relativity show that time is relative, such that there are possible cosmologies where millions and billions of years could have passed in distance. This means that the age of the universe is a question of what clock you are using and not some absolute age. Quantum mechanics shows the universe and everything in it is fundamentally information. This is exactly what is described in Hebrews 11.3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. This is exactly what is described in Hebrews 11.3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. These are just a few examples of scientific support for biblical creation. There are many more that can be given. The gap theory is not only the first of the compromise views, but is also the most biblical one. It proposes that there was a gap of millions or billions of years between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, so as to reconcile the Bible with old earth geological theories. It was invented by the 17th century theologian Simon Espiscus and popularized by Thomas Chalmers beginning in 1814. The gap theory received an additional boost from the notes in the Schofield Study Bible in the early 20th century. This view does have the advantage of providing a time for the fall of Satan. The main problem with this view are lack of any specific reference to such a time and the fact that Genesis 1-2 does not follow Genesis 1-1 in time, but merely describes the initial conditions of Genesis 1-1. The next most biblical view is the day-age theory. Interpreting the days of Genesis 1 has indefinitely long periods of time. It is based in part on 2 Peter 3.8 and the fact that the word day does not always mean a 24-hour day, but can be in a definitely long period of time. 2 Peter 3.8 But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Interpreting the days of creation based on 2 Peter 3.8 only extends time back an additional 6,000 years for a total of 12,000 years. And using 2 Peter 3.8 to justify billions of years is not warranted. Furthermore, Genesis 1 gives contextual reasons for the days being literal days. Each day has a number and is connected to evening and morning, and both show they are literal 24-hour days. Progressive creation is closely related to the day-age theory. However, it only extends the days of creation by mixing them up to make a better fit to the evolution model. While progressive creationists do believe that God created everything without evolution, the pattern is thought to mimic evolution. Progressive creation pays lip service to biblical creation while making hash of the actual account. Theistic evolution is the most unscriptural of the compromised views. Theistic evolution reduces Genesis 1 to 3 to nothing more than poetry or some other form of symbolic language.
They basically take Big Bang to Man evolution and make God nothing more than a guiding force. They effectively call God a liar. In conclusion, the Bible is clear that God created everything about 6,000 years ago Earth time. The Bible is totally at odds with the atheistic mythology called evolution. This ethnic mythology is pushed as science, but it is not real science because it cannot be falsified, since it can be adapted to fit any evidence that may be found. Now it is true, the biblical creation in and of itself cannot be falsified, but scientific theories based on it often make predictions that allow them to be falsified. Many of these theories have had successful predictions, thus verifying rather than falsifying them. However, nothing less should be expected from the Word of God.